Welcome to my course. I'm very excited to have you here. My course is going to be beneficial to you because it's going to help you to understand the healing powers of art and it's also going to help you understand what art therapy is and how it evolved over the years. So without further ado, I would say let's get started. I've been making art my whole life and through my personal and professional experience, I'm convinced that art can help you to gain clarity in who you are and who you want to be and to express your feelings and your thoughts. I made this course for people like you that want to create art for self-healing but need some guidance. And hopefully at the end of this course, you'll be motivated to look up a professional art therapist in your area or to take part at the art therapy workshop or retreat. My course is perfect for you if you're interested in art but also if you're interested in psychology because I give a lot of insight on how both are combined with each other and how art and psychology influence the beginnings of art therapy. This course is also perfect for you if you're willing to work on yourself. Be aware that it's not an art class. It's not an art tutorial. So you're not going to learn how to use certain techniques, but you're going to learn how to use methods and art to express yourself, to express your emotions and your thoughts. To get the best out of this course and to be satisfied at the end, I'm going to now take some time to explain to you what you can do and how you can use this platform so that you will be satisfied and you'll have a nice journey to personal development and self-healing. So you can do this by going to your dashboard first, then click on the Q&A section that you see here and check if someone else has asked your question before. So for example, if you want to ask is white a color, you check and then if no one has asked this color before you, go ahead and add this to the Q&A section. You can also use the Q&A section to introduce yourself. I personally think that's very interesting because that way we can see where everyone is from. And I would also be interested in seeing what you're looking forward to the most in this course. And make sure to check out each PDF that I added to the downloadable section because the PDFs include the art therapy exercises and self-reflection ideas and a lot of bonus material that will help you on your journey to personal development. I want to show you something about Udemy's rating system. So early on in the course, you will be asked to give a rating. I'm not the one asking for an early review, but it comes directly from Udemy. So when you're asked, you can go ahead and type in your first impression. It's okay to type in your first impression because you can still change the rating afterwards. If you click on ask me later, Udemy will keep asking you throughout the course which can be distracting. Another option would be to click on ask me at the end of the course. So as you see here, when you are asked, simply choose the amount of stars, add a short text if you want and that's it. Very simple. So you might ask yourself what art therapy is. Art therapy is a psychotherapy form where a professional art therapist guides you and encourages your self-exploration through drawing, painting, modeling and other forms. 
I'm now going to give you three examples of invented people to give you an idea how art therapy is exactly. So the first person that I want to introduce to you is Aisha. Think of Aisha. Aisha is six years old and she just survived a terrible war. She's now in a refugee camp where they're offering art therapy. She doesn't speak and she has a trauma. And above all things, she now has the possibility in art therapy to be a child again. She can draw, she can paint, she can play with other children, but she also has the possibility to express all the bad images that she has been seeing throughout the last years. The other example that I want to share with you is Steve. Steve is 12 years old and his parents got divorced some years back. Ever since he's been acting out and he's been aggressive. And then one day his mom saw that he was cutting her curtains. So he was showing destructive behavior. Therefore, she decided to send him to art therapy. The art therapist knew from his destructive behavior and she noticed that Steve enjoyed to cut things apart, to tear paper apart and to work with collages. So she allowed him to do a lot of motives where the so-called destructive behavior that he was showing outside in the real world was used in art therapy, but then in a positive way, because suddenly tearing things and cutting things apart was no longer negative, but he was allowed to use this impulsive in a positive way and to express all these um, underlying emotions and problems that he was facing. The last example that I have for you is Yemisi. Yemisi is 40 years old and she's an achiever. She's very, very successful at her job as an entrepreneur, but there's something missing in her life. She's always putting her work first and her family first, but she kind of forgets to also nourish and take care of herself. So one day she breaks down and with the help of a friend, she realizes that she's burnt out. And her friend tells her that maybe it's time to go to an art therapist. So she recommends that to her. Then in art therapy, Yemisi kind of discovers watercolors. She loves working with watercolors because she can let loose and she can work on stress relief. So eventually, with the help of the art therapist, she learns to self-reflect and to also nourish herself and to grow through art therapy. One thing that we humans all have in common is the need to express ourselves. We express ourselves through our body language, through our words, through our actions. We also express ourselves by not saying something or not doing something. But not all ways of expressing yourselves are visible. While your body language is visible, what you say is very powerful, but you cannot see it. It's abstract. When you create art, the power in it is that you're expressing underlying and subconscious aspects of your life and you're making them visible for yourself to understand yourself better but you're also making them visible to others which means that it's easier to express yourself because the things that are abstract and normally invisible if you talk about them suddenly get visible through the artwork that you've created and another thing is that you now created a work that stays it stays visible, which means that you can look back tomorrow and say, oh, this is how I felt yesterday. Or you can look back at your work one year from now and kind of see over the years how you've made progress and how you used to feel or think in, in the past. Okay, so I want to explain to you the difference between product and process. Those are two definitions that are very essential in art therapy. 
So when you are an artist or when you go to art class, it may be interesting and important for you that the product is perfect. So you start creating something with the end goal to do something with a certain technique and to do something that is presentable. So that's laying the focus on the end product. If you lay the focus on the process, which is what we do in art therapy, you're not really looking at the perfect end product, but you're focusing on the process. This means that you really dive into the creative process, that you try to let loose from any judgment, rules, and the idea that what you're creating has to be perfect. The great thing about art therapy is that it's judgment free. Art therapy does not know judgment and does not criticize. So while you may have an inner critic and tell yourself, this is wrong, this does not work, uh, I am not talented, I don't know how to do anything, or my artwork looks ugly, or while you're surrounding and people around you may say that you don't know how to do something, that what you're doing is worthless. This is something from the outside or something that you feel. But in the art therapy world, in the world of creating, everything is possible. So in the art therapy process, you can learn that you are the creator and what you do is powerful because it's your world and you can create your own rules. Welcome to module two. In this module, we're going to look at art therapy in the past and present. You're going to learn what happened that over the years, the profession that we now know as art therapy evolved. Finally, we're going to look at the way that artists used art as therapeutic tool to work on self-healing and to express their emotions and their pain. The two artists that I'm going to introduce in this module are Van Gogh and Frida Kahlo. So enjoy and see you in the lectures. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about the connection between art and psychology. Although contemporary art therapy is a fairly new practice, we now know that art on its own has been used since the beginning of human history as a medium for communicating thoughts and ideas. Art has always been powerful throughout history. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about psychoanalysis and two famous art movements called Surrealism and Expressionism to show you how art and psychology are connected to one another. In the early 1900s, art became an instrument for self-expression and symbolism. The artists started to use art to express their inner thoughts, feelings and also show the world from their own perspective. Therefore, it got less important in the arts to make exact copies of nature. Expressionism and Surrealism are two art movements that were highly influenced by psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis was founded by Sigmund Freud, who is perhaps the most famous name in psychology. Sigmund Freud was an Austrian psychologist and neurologist and his theory has a very strong focus on human soul life and the subconscious. Psychoanalysis focuses on treating mental disorders by making a connection between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. This is what artists that were part of the Surrealism and Expressionism movement were longing for a deeper knowledge of their self and a true connection to their soul. Carl Gustav Jung, an Austrian psychologist and the inventor of analytical psychology, also had a great influence in what we know as art therapy today. Jung examined the full world of the unconscious, whose language he believed to be the symbols that were constantly revealed in dreams. In his psychology praxis, he asked his clients to draw their dreams and unconscious. Jung viewed art making as a means of expressing the sacred and mysterious. 
Jung used art in his own self-analysis and encouraged his patients to express themselves through art. Now we're going to talk about Surrealism. Surrealism is a very famous art movement that originated around 1920 in France. Surrealism refers to something that is removed from all reality and seems unreal and dreamlike. Surrealists focus on everything that has to do with dreamlike, surrealist objects and everything that the human mind can't grasp because it is subject to the subconscious. Examples for surrealist artists that you might have heard of are Salvador Dali, a Spanish painter, and the Belgian painter René Magritte. Both Dali and Magritte created expressive and dreamlike images where unfamiliar or contrasting objects, themes and motives were combined with one another. Similar to what we do in art therapy today, surrealists shared expressions, images and moods that occurred spontaneously and simply reproduced them without censorship. In this method, they wrote down everything that came to mind without thinking first, without controlling or filtering it. This was their way to create a closer connection to the subconscious. Now we're going to talk about Expressionism. Expressionism was a popular artist movement in the late 19th and the 20th centuries and its qualities lies in the highly subjective, personal, spontaneous self-expression of the artist. Expressionism developed as a counter-movement to realism, naturalism and impressionism by simplifying forms and using strong, often high contrast colors. What plays a central role in Expressionism is the subjective, emotional expression of the artist. I will give you three examples of famous Expressionists to give you an insight on this art movement. We will talk about Franz Marc, Amadio Modigliani and August Macke. Franz Marc was one of the key figures of German Expressionism and if you look up his art, you will realize that he loved to paint animals. To him, animals symbolized innocence. He saw them as idealized creatures in perfect harmony with nature. I also chose to add Franz Marc to my course because he believed that colors could evoke deep emotions and associations in us. Amadio Modigliani was an infamous Italian painter that is known today for his beautiful abstract portraits, which mostly show women with a very long neck. What makes Modigliani portray special is that the person in a painting always stays central and there's not a lot happening in the background. Therefore, the focus lies on the woman, her intense gaze and the psychology that is being portrayed by the painting. Modigliani had health problems associated with alcoholism, drug addiction and tuberculosis and he was never successful with his art. Unfortunately, he died penniless at a very young age. Both pictures that you see here show the portrait of Jean Ebuterne. The last painting is from August Macke. Macke developed an easily recognizable style of expressionism, marked by intense, bright colors. Because his art shows a strong sense of calm and order, his artwork is often characterized as gentle expressionism. He became good friends with Franz Marc. Like in any other expressionist painting that you can find, all three artists that I shared with you have the following in common. They all include the elements color, dynamics and feelings. Expressionists were not interested in painting literal representation of nature, but instead wanted to express more subjective matters or states of mind. This is also what we try to do in art therapy. We use art as tool to connect to our subconscious feelings and thoughts and to find ways to express ourselves. I hope this lecture helped you to understand that art and psychology are always a reflection of certain episodes and eras. In the previous lecture, you learned about how psychology and art influenced each other in the 19th century. 
In this lecture, I want to give you an insight on how it began that art therapy became a respected therapy in different institutions. At the beginning of the 20th century, an increasing enthusiasm and interest in the art of the mentally ill arose, who at that time were called the insane or crazy. Some names were Prince Horn, Navratil, and Morgenthaler. They started giving their clients the opportunity to paint. Even though the main motivation of the psychiatrists back then was to gain diagnostic information of their clients through paintings or through drawings, some psychiatrists soon realized that their clients were able to work through traumatic experiences and fears by being creative. One of the doctors that realized that there was greater power in the creation was called Hans Prinzhorn. He was an art historian and doctor who recognized the talent in his patients and began collecting their artworks. His collection is now known as the Prinzhorn Collection and consists of over 5,000 drawings, oil paintings, wood carvings and textile works that were all made by mentally ill patients. The collection can be found at the Heidelberg Psychiatric Clinic in Germany. Adrian Hill was the first man to give a concrete name to art therapy when he became sick with tuberculosis in 1938. He was a professional British artist and started drawing regularly to pass the time in the hospital. According to Hill, he realized the therapeutic value of art while he was sick himself and therefore motivated others to be creative as well. Adrian Hill later wrote a book called Art vs. Illness, where he discusses art and its therapeutic possibilities in detail. Adrian worked closely with a friend of his, the artist Edward Adamson, who also had a great impact on art therapy. Adamson opened a studio where patients could freely create art without comment or judgment from others. He was a proponent of non-interventionist art therapy. This means he enabled patients to simply create art for self-expression rather than making art for a psychological analysis through a professional. Similarly to Prince Horn, Adamson also collected hundreds of thousand pieces of art made by patients and shared them publicly. Over the years, art became an instrument for self-expression and symbolism. However, it wasn't until the 1940s that the therapeutic use of art was defined and developed into a distinct discipline. The discipline arose independently in America and Europe. While Adrian Hill is said to be the pioneer of art therapy in Europe, during the same period, Margaret Naumburg and Edith Kramer introduced art therapy in the USA. By the middle of the 20th century, many hospitals and mental health facilities began including art therapy programs. Institutions began to realize that art therapy could promote emotional, developmental, and cognitive growth in children and adults. Margaret Naumburg called her approach dynamically oriented art therapy based primarily on Freudian theory. Naumburg's work was based on the idea of using art to release the unconscious by the use of free association. Free association is a method used in psychoanalysis where patients are invited to share and express whatever comes into their minds without judgment. Sigmund Freud's theories influenced Naumburg deeply. She was also influenced by Carl Gustav Jung, who was a psychiatrist that explored the inner personal meaning of symbols. Naumburg encouraged her clients to create an artwork and then later on analyze and interpret the symbols and deeper meanings. 
Similar methods were already used in psychoanalysis in the past, but Naumburg was the first to refer to her work as art therapy. The clear difference is that psychoanalysts use art as tool for a diagnostic reference, while art therapists focus on the healing effect of art instead of using it as a diagnostic aid. Now we're going to talk about Edith Kramer. Similarly to Margaret Naumburg, Edith Kramer was also highly influenced by psychoanalysis. She was Austrian, but fled to the USA before World War II and eventually became a U.S. citizen in the 1940s. In the USA, she set up therapeutically orientated art classes in schools and led art therapy programs at pediatric hospitals and other pediatric therapy institutions. Kramer primarily worked with children and adolescents that were often unable to explain their feelings through the use of words. Edith Kramer took the approach that art can be therapy. So, let's come to a conclusion. What we know is that art therapy emerged and developed as a profession in the post-war era in Britain and the USA. Many of the pioneers of art therapy came from the field of art education or the psychoanalytic tradition and started implementing art as therapy in different institutions such as sanatoriums, hospitals and schools in the late 1930s. This is the end of the lecture. See you in the next one. You now know that art influences psychology and psychology influences art. They both influence each other. So in the following lectures, I'm going to talk about two famous artists, Van Gogh and Frida Kahlo, and show you how they manage to use art to express their emotions and pain. This lecture is about Vincent van Gogh, who is considered one of the most popular artists of modern art. I will give you several examples for you to see how Vincent van Gogh shows and evokes emotions through his art. Chances are high that you already know a lot about Van Gogh, who is considered the greatest Dutch painter after Rembrandt. It is very interesting to look at his life and art, and one can definitely say that he used art as therapeutic medium. Van Gogh struggled with mental illnesses from an early age, and he checked himself into a mental hospital in Saint-Rémy, France in the late 19th century. This might have been the most productive period of his life. According to the hospital, he produced more than 100 drawings and 150 paintings while he was staying at the hospital. He was hospitalized for about a year and creating art helped him to stay emotionally balanced. After Van Gogh's death, a lot of people speculated about possible illnesses that he might have had. Two popular assumptions are that he might have suffered from schizophrenia or manic depression. Schizophrenia makes people lose touch with reality, and it would have affected how Van Gogh thought, felt and behaved in general. And if he was manic depressed, this would mean that his mood switched between manic and depressed episodes. This means while he was manic, he might have felt very high, with lots of energy, he might have had increased activity levels and felt less need to sleep. Whereas in depressed phases, he might have felt very sad, down, empty or hopeless, and you can assume that he had very little energy to paint and generally low activity levels. I want to look at the following paintings with you to show you that paintings can definitely communicate or convey certain emotions. In all three paintings, you can see that the subjective and emotional state of the artist are being portrayed and not a 100% realistic painting that you could compare to a photograph. All three paintings have in common that they show one large tree called Cypress. Van Gogh lived in the south of France for some years where the cypress tree is very common. 
In Van Gogh's paintings, cypresses are frequent motifs and they usually take up a lot of space in his painting. They start at the bottom of the page and go right up to the top of the painting, which gives them a quite dominant character. Their dominant form and dark color overpower the landscape. This can be seen clearly on the first painting on the left, where the cypress takes in most of the space. I think Van Gogh's paintings are so popular today because he expressed his life via his works and his impulsive application of paint and use of symbols and vibrant colors make his paintings very interesting to look at. One painting that I want to describe in detail is the famous Starry Night that Van Gogh painted while he was in the psychiatric hospital in Saint-Rémy, France. The dark cypress tree draws attention. It takes up a lot of space and goes from the bottom of the canvas up to the top. The dark tree forms a contrast to the light and illuminated sky and stars. While the lines of the cypress are vertical and sharp, the lines in the sky are rather wavy and horizontal. The dark tree forms a contrast to the light and illuminated sky and stars. While the lines of the cypress are vertical and sharp, the lines in the sky are rather wavy and horizontal. The brush strokes of the painting are dynamic and there's a lot of movement in the painting. As another contrast, you could compare the organic tree and sky to the geometric shapes of the little village that you can see on the right corner. The village takes in a very little space in the painting and you can see a building that looks like a church. Unfortunately, Van Gogh was never successful as an artist, but now his pieces are worth millions. His beautiful art shows so much emotion that we will never fully understand. In this painting you see another motive that Van Gogh is known for. Besides his interest in painting cypresses and landscapes, Van Gogh loved to paint sunflowers. Van Gogh shared a lot of thoughts and ideas with his brother Theo. His diaries and letters give us a lot of insights on his emotional state. But a lot will always remain a mystery to us when we can only make assumptions about his intentions and the meanings of the symbols and colors in his artwork. I hope you enjoyed this lecture and learned more about Van Gogh and his emotional state. The next artist that I want to talk about is Frida Kahlo, a Mexican artist and feminist. In this lecture, I will describe to you how Frida Kahlo used art to express her intense emotional and physical pain. Frida Kahlo, Mexico's greatest female artist, painted brutally honest self-portraits that reveal her psychological response to what she was going through in life. Topics that are very present in Kahlo's self-portraits are identity, the human body and death. When Frida was six years old, she fell seriously ill with polio and spent a lot of her childhood in bed. As a result of this condition, she had a shorter and thinner leg throughout her life. In 1925, when Frida was 18, her life changed dramatically. In a bus accident, her pelvis was pierced by a steel bar. The consequences of this accident were lifelong pain and severe physical limitations. After the accident, Frida was tied to the bed again for a long period of her life and had to wear a steel corset, sometimes plaster corsets. Frida Kahlo was married to the famous Mexican muralist Diego Rivera that she met as a student. They were often separated and occasionally lived in different homes over the years. In 1939, Diego and Frida got divorced. This is when she painted one of her most famous paintings called The Two Fridas. You can see the two versions of Frida. The painting shows a double vision that Frida has of herself. On the left, she portrays herself as a woman with a broken heart, dressed in a traditional European Victorian white dress. 
On the right, her heart is complete and she wears a modern Mexican dress. A style that she adopted during her marriage to Rivera as she began to be more a public figure. She wore a lot of native costumes that highlighted her link with nature and to the Mexican culture. You can see that both Fridas are deeply connected because they are holding hands and there's another bond that is symbolized through a single vein that branches out and lies on the arms and shoulders of both Fridas. And while Frida on the right is holding a little portrait of her ex-husband Rivera, the Frida on the left cuts the vein with a scissors and it actually looks like a surgical scissors. And you see the blood dripping on her white dress. After Frida Kahlo had her accident, she began to paint to fill the time wisely. Her famous art shows that she used her creativity to express her experiences and the physical pain. This slide is one of her most famous paintings that she made in 1944. Her spine is totally shattered. She wears a surgical brace and there are nails all through her body. They show the consistent pain that she went through. In this painting, Frida used art to express her physical challenges that she went through. You're now going to learn about the psychology of red. It is a warm color and one of those colors that have a strong influence on our physical needs and our will to survive. The color red attracts attention in an emotional context and it is a color that is very sensitive to the human eye. Because red is a color that draws our attention, it is often used in traffic. So think of road signs that are red, traffic lights, and other important notices that should all warn us. You will also notice that those traffic signs are often red mixed with black. This is because the combination of red and black signals to our brain that we have to pay attention. This is actually something that human beings copied from nature. If you look at animals, you will notice that several of them, like frogs, snakes, and butterflies, have very bright colors. The idea behind this is that they want to shock their predators and signal them to back off. This is the opposite of what other animals do. Like you will know that some animals try to be invisible by camouflaging themselves. So for example, a snake that is um, more in an environment where everything is brown. So her own skin is brown too, or maybe butterflies that sit on one um, particular flower and have the same flower so that they will not be seen by their predators. But as I said before, these animals go for the root to be very, very bright and to kind of shock and scare their predators away. Research has shown that people tend to associate red with negative and it kind of evokes negative emotions since it is the color of fire, blood, aggression and some dangerous or scary looking animals. Red has different connotations. You can think of blood but you can also have more positive associations like strength, love, warmth and passion. On the other hand, red attracts attention in a positive way. For example, when someone wears a red dress or outfit, that person will definitely be seen by us. Nature actually intends us to experience certain colors as intense, as I told you already. Apart from being attracted to someone because of their voice, their odor, body language, and other things that all happen on a subconscious level, color plays a very big role. 
This is also stated by the psychologist Andrew Elliott, who says that the relationship between the color red and sexual attraction mainly has biological roots. But cultural influences also play a big role for the reason that men and women find red attractive. In ancient cultures and societies, red often represented a symbol of status and power. The most noble red used to be purple red. Kings were crowned in purple coats and cardinals, for example, wore purple red as well. Because powerful and rich people wore red in the past, up until today we still have those associations. Another example that I want to share with you also has to do with power and wealth and it's the example of the red carpet. Because you might wonder why certain events with famous celebrities, politicians and monarchs have a red carpet. Well, several centuries ago, red was a very expensive color. It was actually processed out of snails. Thousand snails had to be processed for one single gram of this color. So only rich people could afford a fabric in purple or purple red. This thought that red is a precious and expensive color remained with us to this day, which is why celebrities and the elite walk on a red carpet at every award ceremony or event. So now let's look at red in art therapy. Red has a deep effect on our soul and our unconscious and as said before, it affects us physically. Using a lot of red in art can communicate the need to draw attention to something specific. Red can be used as a warning or to show unconscious needs and desires. It can show strong emotions like love, anger, and feelings of excitement or intensity. Red stands for blood. That's why it kind of symbolizes war and it also symbolizes life. In art therapy, it can also communicate political standpoints. Remember that red is also a color of communism and socialism. So if you look up different flags of the world, you will see that those countries that are communists have red in their flag or mostly the whole flag is actually red. Red is also often used in idioms. Do you have interesting sayings in your mother language where red is mentioned? In English, for example, one thing that I can think of is when people say that they're seeing red. When they say this, they mean that a person becomes very angry and expresses anger. Another example how the color red is used in language is when you say that you roll out the red carpet for someone. This means that the person who says this expresses that someone else is receiving a special treatment. So as you see, similarly to how we use colors verbally, we can use them in art therapy to express ourselves on emotional, cultural and political levels. You've reached the end of this class. See you in the next one. Now we're going to talk about pink, the color of tenderness. Pink is a red toned down by white. The fact that red is being toned down has a strong influence on how we see pink today. Here you see two images. On the right side, you see a red leaf. On the left side, you see a pink rose. If you compare those colors, it is very easy to see that pink has a mix of red and white. And actually, the symbolic meaning of pink is opposite to that of red. While red is strong and dynamic and sometimes aggressive, pink appears delicate and distant, but also powerless. It is the color that we associate most with tenderness. Nowadays, we associate pink with traits like calmness, sweetness, tenderness, and joy. In the Western world, pink represents the feminine, shy, and tender aspects. And pink holds negative connotations, negative connotations that we have to femininity, like weakness and helplessness. Pink is a typical female color whose acceptance by women and men 
differs greatly. While 8% of women find pink more beautiful than any other color, 12% of men rank it as the color they like the least. The way we experience a color is strongly influenced by our culture. In recent years, however, pink is increasingly favored by young consumers. It is a very trendy color, not only worn by women, but also by men. It is interesting to note that the associations that we have to pink have been drastically changing over the years. In Western culture, we kind of assume that pink has naturally always been for little girls because that's how it has been the last decades. However, this is not how it used to be. While pink is a typical color for clothes and decoration for girls, at least in the Western society, and blue is seen as a typical color for boys, it used to be the other way around. If you look at this image, you see a boy dressed in pink. This is something that you will hardly see in our time today. You will hardly see a boy dressed in pink. For centuries, pink was the color of little boys in the Western culture. Because pink was also called the little red. And because red was considered a signal color of masculinity, pink was logically assigned to the boys. And girls were dressed in blue because blue was the color of the Virgin Mary. In advertising, pink is often used by brands. Brands that want to be associated with femininity, softness and youth. By using pink for a cream, for example, the brand is referring to the delicacy and softness of the skin, which should either be preserved or restored by the cosmetic product that they are selling. Because we associate pink with softness and delicacy, and also innocence through the connection of white, it is a popular color for baby products. If you think of baby toys, baby toiletries and similar things, you will notice that a lot of them are either in pink or blue. Research shows that pink has a calming effect on most people. It promotes inner peace and reduces aggression. In color psychology, pink is a sign of hope. It is a positive color. It inspires warm and comforting feelings a sense that everything will be okay. In society, pink can signal belonging to the gay and lesbian scene. In the dream analysis, which is a method in Freud's psychoanalysis, the color pink stands for one's own desires and needs. As you have learned so far, the symbolism of colors strongly depend on your cultural and personal background. The colors a person uses in art therapy can symbolize a personal preference or show a relation to political, cultural or emotional connections. In art therapy, using pink can show a sense of identity. How do you see yourself or how do you want to be seen by society? When pink is used a lot, I also look out if there's a link to femininity and attributes linked to feminine nature, like gentleness, empathy, humility, sensitivity, just to name a few examples. This is the end of the lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. Hello. I'm very honored that you've been watching this far. This means that you're really interested in art therapy and everything this course has to offer. So actually what you've been watching the past minutes, nearly uh, 40 minutes, I believe, is actually a preview of a course that I have on a platform called Udemy. Some years ago, hi, Thank you so much for watching so far. Um, if you are still here, this means that you're really interested in art therapy and what my course has to offer so far. So actually, I am Annika Kende. I am the one that created the preview of the course that you've been watching here on YouTube. And it's actually just a part of a four hour course that is available on a platform called Udemy. So if you're interested, just check the link below because I've added the link to enroll in the description. In the upcoming part of this video, I'm going to show you in um, a screenshot or I'm going to share my screen and show you exactly what you get when you are interested and if you decide to enroll to the course. So let's get started right here. You can see that I'm already 
in the platform here on the left it says udemy that's where the where you just need to enroll as a membership and oh, hi Thank you so much for watching this far. I'm really grateful that you're interested in what I have to offer because if you've been watching until now, it means that you're really interested in art therapy and that you enjoy my teaching style. So again, my name is Annika Kende. I am actually an instructor on Udemy. I'm a certified, certified art therapist. And years, a few years back, I decided to create a course on art therapy for those people that want to get an idea what art therapy even means and also get to know some of the very important and very um how would you say it like very efficient steps to use art for self-healing and obviously it is always best to have the face-to-face -face contact offline with an art therapist like there's no doubt about that but sometimes in life we also want to create something and concentrate on self-care when we're at home so that's what the whole course is about but it's also made for people that are thinking of maybe studying art therapy and that want to see what art therapy is and like what type of exercises an art therapist does so that's what it's for and actually, if you stay with me, I'm now going to show you exactly how the course looks like and what you can expect if you choose to enroll. So we are actually here in the Udemy interface. You can see here on the left and it's showing you that my art therapy course is called Personal Development and Self-Healing through art, but that part doesn't show. And then let's get started. So let me just close the tabs. You can see that the whole course consists of 13 modules now they're called sections and um down here let me move myself to the top it says art, about this course art therapy for your soul drawing and painting your way to personal development and self-healing through art skill level beginner level but i would say it's actually beginner to advance because i start with the facts with you know some background information about art about psychology and like how the pioneers of art therapy and then the more you dive into the deep, the course i would say the more advanced it becomes you can see at the moment uh, at the moment of filming this i have 303 no 137 lectures and four total hours so there's a lot of content and in total there are 30 art therapy exercises so let's have a look at the sections i start with introduction to art therapy so if you already know art therapy obviously you're free to skip that part but i introduce myself i introduce what art therapy is then what are the benefits of art therapy what is the difference between creating a product and creating a pro like being in the process because in art therapy it's not about you know creating beautiful things that you can sell or something and yeah anyway you can just look at the link in the description and look at the details i'm going to read out everything then module two art therapy connection between art and psychology so then i'm giving you you know like a history information like the beginning of art therapy how it started in uh, psychiatric hospitals then what is interesting and what i shared with you before is how famous artists like van gogh and frida kahlo used art to express their pain express their feelings and to kind of do therapy on their on themselves then section three i'm giving you psychology background when it comes to color so the psychology of red the psychology of green um i included a lot of colors and you know symbols and all those beautiful things then i know that some people will be interested in how to even set up a healing and creative workspace choosing art supplies like should you sit or stand uh should you work with music or not all those beautiful things I'm kind of rushing through this because if you're interested, you can look at the course outline yourself. Then section five, qualities of materials for therapeutic art. Like 
does it matter what type of materials you use and what type of properties do different materials have? And again, of course, if you're already intermediate or, or advanced, just go directly to the modules that are interesting to you. Now, I know that a lot of people, they want to act. They want to get into like doing and being active. So that's in section six, art therapy exercises, express yourself with mandalas. So express yourself with a flower mandala, express yourself with a gratitude mandala, so many mandala ideas. Section seven, art therapy exercises, express yourself with self portraits. So draw yourself as a tree, uh, one day as a superhero, being a strong animal for a day, just click through. Then section eight, art therapy exercises where you're using collages, vision board, inspirational co uh, collage, my feelings today, so many cool things that I came up with. Section seven, express yourself, oh, sorry, I already had that. Section nine, express yourself with shapes. So for example, what does it mean when you're creating a circle or when you're creating a square? So I'm giving you some deep information about the shapes and symbols. Then section, where are we? Section 10, express yourself abstract, like color your emotions, coloring wet in wet, scribble drawings, that's section 10 for you. Then section 11, express yourself with polarities. Like what does it mean? Like what happens? Like what do you, ex um, what do you feel when you're able to create structured versus creating a little bit more loose, chaotic? So you're going to practice the polarities then dry versus wet. Um, Express yourself with your non-dominant hand, like a lot of cool exercises for you there. Section 12, creative tools for your personal development and self-healing. So there I added stuff like making a visual diary, then uh, creating an art portfolio, then the advantages of a SWOT analysis, how to set up smart goals, and a lot of articles for you. And yeah, that's it. I hope you really, really enjoyed this. I'm going to share one more, a few more lectures with you so that you can kind of see what type of exercises we're doing. And then, yeah, the last section or module is just me congratulating you and thanking you for being part of the course. So that is my course for you. As I said, four hours. Let's go. Let's go to the Udemy um, page. So this is how it looks like, what to learn. There's so many different courses here. A lot of best-selling courses, just have a look. It's great to have you in module six. Module six will help you to express yourself with mandalas. Mandalas are very popular for a reason. A mandala can help you to be centered, to relax, to meditate. And it can also help you with self-empowerment. I always recommend people to make their own mandala from scratch. Nowadays, there's so many printouts and templates available online or a lot of mandala books, which is okay, but the benefits of making a mandala are higher if you make one yourself. Because starting to, to trace a circle and to choose what you're going to create is already part of the creative process. And then at the end, having an end result and seeing what you yourself created, what is unique and what no one else has done, that's by far a higher benefit than taking a copy of a mandala that someone else created for you. So as I said, this module is full of different mandala exercises. I hope that the exercises are going to help you and to inspire you to then create your own ideas. This exercise is called flower mandala.
As always, I hope that you're somewhere where you feel comfortable and that you're really ready to start. So the first thing that you should do is to trace a circle and then I invite you to close your eyes. Close your eyes and imagine that you are in a flower field. What type of flowers do you see? Walk through the field, enjoy the smell of the flowers that you see, touch the flowers and pick one. And then with this flower that you just imagined, try to take that idea and create your flower mandala and just see what happens and then see you in the self-reflection part. So now we're in the self-reflection part of the flower mandala that you just created. Were you able to visualize a flower field? Did you smell the flowers? Did you really pick a flower? How was that for you? How did you feel when you went through the flower field? And how did you feel while you were creating this flower mandala? How do you feel now that this exercise is over and what did this exercise mean to you? This is the end. See you in the next exercise. Welcome to this exercise. What you're going to do in this exercise is that you're going to draw a paint with your non-dominant hand. And I think this is really a very interesting thing to do because we mostly use our dominant hand. Let me explain clearly what I mean by dominant hand. So if we write, we all have one hand that we usually write with. In my case, I write with my right hand and other people write or eat with their left hand. So that means that my right hand is my dominant hand and so it's the hand that uh, is easy to use. And if I have to do things with my left hand single-handedly, I personally um, make the experience that it's harder and that my right hand the one that I write with and eat with is the stronger one. So for this exercise, what you're going to do is that you're going to take tape and tape your paper on the surface that you're working on. By taping the paper to the surface, you're going to enable yourself to work freely because the paper is not going to move. And then start drawing or painting and try to be free. Try not to think too long what you're going to create. The best thing is to set a time. So to just allow yourself to work on an image for five minutes and then go on to the next image and to the next image. So instead of working on this for half an hour or an hour, you can make little sections and like a series of experimentations with your non-dominant hand. And if you have fun doing this exercise, um, I would recommend you to try different materials and not only one to see if you see a difference or maybe to experience that it's easier for you or for your non-dominant hand if you use one certain material. Enjoy this exercise and make sure you do the self-reflection as well. Great, now you want to take some time to self-reflect. So, as I said before, most of us are not used to using both hands. Mostly people that are left-handed are used to using both hands, but people that are right-handed usually eat and write just with their right hand. So, I would invite you to write down your experiences. How was it for you to use your non-dominant hand? Write down your experiences, write down how you felt, also try to give meaning to the exercise. Was it playful? Did you have a lot of fun? Did you enjoy the experiment? Or did you do it very short, five minutes, and then you stopped because you didn't feel free and you didn't feel like you could open up and experiment? Feel free to add your own ideas and also find out for yourself if this is an exercise that you want to do more in the future. If it was a learning moment for you, it's advisable to try this and do it several times 
so that you will get more used to doing something and getting out of your comfort zone.